10. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy and also Luke, the writer of Acts, they are God's big foursome. They're about to enter Europe with the gospel and plant churches and plant seeds of Western civilization. These four guys are on fire for Christ and it will take holiness and determination to get the church going in that area because many of our ancestors came from that area and it was very a sinful, very sinful area. 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Th Samothrace and the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia a colony and we were staying in that city for some days Philippi was a Roman colony these people were Roman citizens they had Roman customs they spoke Latin and they were very immoral and so these men of God have their work cut out for them verse 13 and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there the Jews in the Roman Empire often held their religious meetings as far away from the heathen as they possibly could so these ladies are outside the city limits praying and you know what this little prayer group right here meeting outside the city by the riverside that little prayer group may have been the reason that God told Paul to take the gospel to Europe rather than to China or to Africa these ladies these people were praying and God heard that prayer and sent these missionaries into Europe as an answer to that prayer so never underestimate the power of our prayers 14 now a certain woman named Lydia heard us she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul Lydia believed and applied the word of God that Paul taught God opened her heart because of our sin nature man's heart is naturally closed to the Word of God it takes the power of God to open our hearts to his word 15 and when she and her household were baptized she begged us saying if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord come to my house and stay so she persuaded us Lydia insisted that the apostles stay at her place and I suppose it's only natural for Christians who are fed the Word of God to want to continue to listen to the Word of God and that's no doubt why she wanted him there 16 now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling fortune telling similar practices are forbidden by God in his word but it is a money maker today as it was with this girl and her owner so like many other bad things it is done in spite of the fact that it is bad 17 this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation someone says men great isn't this fantastic she is speaking this demon possessed girl she's speaking well of Paul and the message of Christ how wonderful no it is not great it is Satan being very slick being very sly watch this the Jews who lived in that area they needed Christ but they knew that this girl was under the control of demons because they knew that fortune telling and stuff like she was doing it was all demonic it was it was forbidden by God and so this is Satan's attempt to turn those Jews off to the message of Jesus 
a demon-influenced girl, a demon-possessed girl saying Jesus is the way would make the Jews skeptical of Christ. Verse 18 And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to said to uh, the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. St. Paul did not want the help of some demon. The last thing Christ wants is some demons ask a moral person claiming to speak for him. God doesn't need to be identified with that sort of person. 19. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. So this girl was delivered from a demon and from one of the sins which was ruining her soul but her owners don't care they don't care her owners are angry because she cannot tell the future anymore see the word of God was tolerated by her owners until it started costing them some cash now they're angry now they bring Paul and Silas in arrest this guy arrest these guys verse 20 and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. In other words, this Paul is a troublemaker, Your Honor. If a Christian is faithful to speak truth and live holy, then someone in this wicked world is going to get angry about it. 21. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Rome had several legal religions and they were suspicious of any new religion that came along and that's why they viewed Christianity with suspicion. 22 And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded, to be, commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely. The Jews, by order of God in his word in the Old Testament, could not whip a criminal more than 39 times. The Romans had no limit. And so Paul and Silas get a beating from the Romans. They get a severe beating because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And later on, in 2 Corinthians, Paul will write, and see how he was beaten beyond number, meaning he was beaten beyond the number 39. That man suffered for Jesus Christ. 24. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, get this picture. Paul and Silas, backs ripped open. Looked like shredded paper, probably. Then they are thrown into a varmint-infested, filthy prison. They are laying on their backs with those open sores, laying on their backs with their legs spread and their feet locked in stocks. I wanted that picture to be clear in our minds before we read, before we read verse 25. Look at it. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas were not angry at God for their situation. They were worshiping God. In this miserable situation, they are worshiping God. The other prisoners who did not know Christ were listening to them. They were observing Paul and Silas while they were in this miserable and painful situation. And you never know who is watching you. You just don't. You never know who is observing you as a Christian, taking note of how you, as a Christian, handle trouble. And it can either be a good testimony or a bad one. 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Paul and Silas... We're not praising God in order to 
get him to do something. They were praising God. Period. Praising God so your circumstances will change, that is not a good reason to praise God. That is a selfish reason to praise God. Praise God because He deserves it. Not to try to manipulate Him. Praising God should be focused on the goodness of God. Now, if He should intervene and change the situation for the better, well, that's a bonus. And often He does. And God gave Paul and Silas a big bonus right here. 27. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Suicide is a sin. But in that culture it was considered an honorable way out, especially if death was imminent anyway. And death was definitely imminent here because any guard who allowed his prisoner to escape would be put to death. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Paul did not care whether this jailer was an enemy or not. He didn't want him to die, and he didn't want him to go to hell. So he stepped in and prevented his death, and he will tell the jailer about Jesus Christ. 29. Then he, the jailer, called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man had been on the edge of hell. But because Paul cared, he is now on the edge of salvation. You know, Paul and Silas could have ran out of that lousy prison and could have left this man die and go to hell. But they didn't. Instead of escaping... Paul yells out, hey, we're all here, don't kill yourself. Paul would rather remain in custody in a lousy situation if it meant that this jailer had an opportunity to receive Christ. That is the kind of Christ focus that Paul and Silas had. And so he says, what must I do to be saved? 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is not talking about an intellectual event, an intellectual belief. Salvation is more than that. You have to take the whole Bible when it comes to any doctrine. And the faith that saves clearly in the Bible is in essence a relationship with Christ. Saving faith is repentance, it includes repentance. It includes a relationship that serves Christ out of love. That's what saving faith is. And this jailer is offered that relationship right here. And next time, we will pick up our study in verse 32. Until then, Michael Murat here for Scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.